So, good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to this uh, webinar session on remittances as a driver of women's financial inclusion in the Mekong region, uh, hosted here by the uh, United Nations Capital Development Fund. Um, great to have you uh, online. Um, I want to quickly go through uh, some, some, some practicalities first on the software. Uh, so we're logged into BlueJeans. Uh, the whole session will take about uh, uh, one hour. We'll try to keep it uh, clock sharp. And um, a, a couple of things with the software. So you can unmute yourself if you want to uh, uh, start a conversation. Uh, the other option is to chat in the chat boxes if you have any questions during the webinar. Um, and finally, there's some people who are logged in with the name guest. We've got guest one, two, three, four, five. Uh, you can write your name uh, or any other comment uh, in, instead. It would be great to uh, to know who uh, who's on the line. We we have quite some uh, uh, registrations on the on the webinar, um, and uh, so so we, we, we've got a booked full session, which is great. Um, I wanted to first um, uh, also thank uh, in advance here our guest speaker, uh, Gabor Hava from Transfer2. Uh, Gabor, could you quickly unmute yourself just to make sure that you're online and uh, we've got the, the connectivity going? Can you hear me? This is Gabor Hava speaking. Perfect, yes, thank you. Uh, so Gabor uh, will we'll, uh, come uh, and, and, and showcase uh, one of our pilot innovations, Transfer2, uh, on the Challenge Fund uh, um, and uh, uh, later in the webinar. Thanks for joining. Um, to briefly introduce UNCDF for those who are not familiar with uh, the United Nations Capital Development Fund, there are many agencies within the UN. I think in Bangkok, I've heard there's alone 101 agencies. So we're not always up to date uh, with what the mandates and the activities are of each individual institution. Um, the UNCDF is, is particularly taking care of this sustainable development goal, recently become a sustainable development goal of financial inclusion, uh, with a particular focus on least developed nations. Uh, we're here based in the Bangkok Regional Office, um, and uh, a lot of the work that we do has been focusing, for example, on Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam, uh, also Nepal, Bangladesh, uh, in this region. Um, within the uh, UNCDF, the narrative, uh, what we do has, has carefully shifted uh, itself and uh, we have been, uh, say 10 years ago, uh, people would talk about financial inclusion. Uh, nowadays uh, the, the focus has been on financial inclusion for specific sustainable development goals. So we have, for example, programs on uh, Clean Start, which is a, a program on um, uh, digital financial inclusion for the purpose of reducing energy poverty. Uh, we have this program SHIFT, which is Shaping uh, Inclusive Finance Transformation, which has a specific focus on women's economic empowerment. Uh, we also have programs on, uh, that's focused on youth uh, empowerment and entrepreneurship. Um, so why does the UNCDF uh, intervene in the remittances space? Um, essentially, Um, we have set up a, a program which is called SHIFT, Shaping Inclusive Finance Transformation, and this program uh, is running for uh, two, three years now, um, and uh, it, the purpose of that is to advance women's economic empowerment through financial inclusion. Uh, remittances is, is, has always been a, a, a space that we were fascinated to work in, uh, particularly because of the cross-border situation. Um, so sending money from Thailand or, or, or uh, Malaysia uh, to Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos and Vietnam. And what we knew, generally speaking, is that a lot of recipients and a lot of migrants are women, um, but we didn't know exactly how many of them, uh, where they were based uh, and, and uh, uh, what their specific uh, product needs are in the space of remittances. So that's something that we're focusing on with, uh, with, with, with this uh, intervention. Um, we have within SHIFT uh, to create or enable or facilitate a market change, uh, you need more than just um, money. 
uh, more than just uh, private sector investment. So what, one of the things that's unique about EU and CDF is that we work both with the private sector as well as the public sector, uh, as mentioned, in some of the most difficult markets uh, in the world. Um, Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam uh, are in themselves in their uh, uh, inception phase when it comes to uh, remittances products. Um, and so we're working both with the regulators on policy advocacy as well as the private sector, for example, on product innovation. And on top of that, we're also working with the sector associations, with a lot of other players uh, in those markets, uh, uh, for example, on uh, learning and capacitation. Um, and all of this is also underpinned by uh, data and research, uh, which is our fourth uh, uh, activity type, if you like. Um, and data and research, in a way, underpins everything that the UN does. Um, we always advocate for data-driven product development and for uh, data-driven policy making. Um, so that's a bit of an introduction on SHIFT. Um, we have set up, as part of this whole venture, a, a challenge fund, which is um, encouraging the private sector, or incentivizing the private sector to come up with new product innovations uh, to address uh, women's financial inclusion issues. Um, before we ask you to join this webinar, we ask you kindly to uh, give us a bit of feedback through a survey. Um, we asked particularly what would you think uh, are key challenges for customers and for uh, products and service providers, remittance service providers, financial service providers, in offering remittances to Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos and Vietnam to the last mile customers. Um, and we have on this call, we have a really interesting mix of people. Uh, we have regulators on the call, we have donors on the call, we have remittance service providers on the call, uh, we have fintech firms on the call. Um, and all of you actually, and that, that's quite interesting, set common uh, uh, denominators, common, common uh, challenges. Um, and we've done a long running research, which we'll present later on this as well, which confirms many of these challenges. Uh, the one that's cited the most often, interestingly, is transaction cost. The second one is accessibility, and in particular geographical accessibility, to the number of access points um, that customers have, that migrants have to, to receive their remittances or to send their remittances is, is insufficient. Um, accessibility, of course, can also be a bit broader. It can also be that people may not, uh, even though the bank might be around the corner, they just don't want to go into the bank. Uh, to to uh, send services back and uh, to send money transfers back and forth. Uh, customer identification, particularly for low income migrants, is seen as an issue. Um, customer awareness and financial literacy. The bank may be around the corner, but the customer might not know what the bank does for them. Um, trust is a, is, a, is a major issue, particularly in these least developed nations, and to some extent also, for example, in Malaysia. Uh, and, and, and Thailand and even Singapore. Uh, regulations come across remittances, uh, not just for providers, but also for customers. Um, and an interesting answer, which I like personally a lot, is uh, that the barriers for customers are unknown, which might probably be very accurate. We don't have a lot of knowledge on what customers and migrants are thinking, uh, needing, and what their behavior uh, once they receive the products. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of studies that we come across, and this is one of the major reasons why we decided to do one before we launched the Challenge Fund. Um, key innovations, uh, we asked uh, you all, what do you think the next five years will look like? What will be some of the big uh, innovations that will be launched in the remittances space? Uh, digital solutions was mentioned by many of you. A blockchain is a specific example of that, where people think that that will launch off not just in the remittances sector, but also maybe in other sectors, but remittances being one of the potential, clear potential markets for this. Uh, E-wallets and mobile transfers, uh, of which we'll have a, a, a case uh, later on. Uh, fintech firms. Uh, next week there's the Fintech Festival in Singapore, where uh, we will host a session on uh, um, the Challenge Fund and on this research. Um, remittances linked financial products, uh, linking remittances with savings products was seen as a, as a uh, 
uh, a key area for innovation in the future. Biometric identification, financial education, human-centric design, which can be anywhere of, of just tailoring uh, a product towards the needs of a customer, towards studying those needs to see how we can better uh, accompany uh, the, service delivery, the service delivery for them. Um, and finally, public-private partnerships. Um, so uh, that was quite interesting to see that as part of the innovation landscape, there, there is an acknowledgement and a, a real need for partnerships, which is something that we're trying to accommodate also through the uh, shift program uh, very prominently. Um, to start about our uh, ASEAN uh, remittance study, basically we said before we're going to ask the private sector to come up with innovations, do we really know what the challenge is for those customers? And that was one of the major objectives of doing this study. So what we wanted to explore particularly is not just the formal remittances market, but also the informal remittances markets of Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, um, with the idea that that can help identify some innovative solutions to cross-border payments. Um, Second, we had the very concrete objective in that, because it's, it's nice to do a lot of research, but to really also launch product innovations that can address those issues, uh, and as well inform policy making while innovations are going on and, and through the research itself. Um, as part of this uh, next week, as I mentioned, there's the FinTech Festival in Singapore. Uh, I think that about 30,000 people are attending this uh, festival, which makes it one of the biggest uh, in the world. Um, and what we were quite happy with is that we could get a partnership with Mass um, on this challenge fund, together with uh, with uh, DFAT, who are the main sponsor of the uh, the, the program of Shift. Um, and um, as part of this uh, uh, Singapore fintech festival, we'll have a session next week on Wednesday. For, for those who are in Singapore, please join that uh, session. You, you're really welcome to, uh, we would be uh, more than welcome to invite you. Um, on the research uh, methodology, um, what we've done is we've used um, national financial inclusion surveys to map out the remittances um, landscape. Um, so we have about 10,000 surveys that were conducted on national financial inclusion that have been used for the national financial inclusion strategies. And we have looked particularly at the sub-segments of remittance recipients. Uh, these studies were done in Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar, uh, both on the informal and the formal financial markets. Uh, in addition, we spoke to um, migrants. Uh, we, we've done qualitative interviews, actually, with the migrants living here in Bangkok, um, as well as uh, those in, uh, in Myanmar. Um, and we, we've done, uh, to, just to ask them how they perceive sending money from Bangkok to um, Myanmar and, and what steps they see and what, what, what uh, challenges they face in sending the money back and forth to their families. Uh, we've also done personal interviews and online surveys with uh, some of you on the call. Um, we've interviewed over 70 experts that it was done last year um, in Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam uh, at the supply side, uh, asking uh, people, okay, now that we have an understanding what comes out and what customers need, what could you potentially do about it? Um, and, and so those are the sort of uh, uh, the key backbone of our study. Um, the study is, all, by the way, already published. Uh, it's online, uh, and at the end of the PowerPoint is a link towards it. Um, as well as some of the site material. We have a, a blog uh, that we just published, a new one on this, uh, this challenge fund, um, and we'll, we'll keep you posted uh, through Twitter and LinkedIn as well. Um, now, coming to the study outcomes. So what we, what we already knew in um, Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos, and Vietnam is that there's about $6 billion of official development aid flowing into these countries. Um, and basically, those are all official development aid flows. Um, what we also know is that there's about 17 billion in formal remittances flowing into the country. That's almost three times the size of development aid. So there's a, there's a clear case for private sector development 
to support not just the microeconomic situation in the country, but also the macroeconomic situation. Um, now, we know that. A lot of remittances, conferences that we go to, uh, people will mention this. This is nothing new. Uh, but what we, we didn't really know, strangely enough, in, in, in my view, is, is what is the size of these informal flows that are flowing into Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos, and Vietnam. And our study uh, comes up with a range, but the lower end of the range is about $6 billion. The upper end of the range is about $17 billion uh, through different ways of estimating the, um, uh, the amount. Um, but so there's a sizable portion which might be equal to the total size of the formal flows, of unregulated flows, which could potentially, I'm saying potentially here, but be digitized or formalized um, if there were digital finance innovations in Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos, and Vietnam, which there are not or very few of. Um, so that for us was a clear um, sort of market estimate to intervene into this uh, new market. The other thing is what remittances can potentially do for, for a nation, uh, for a society, um, particularly when uh, they're linked with other financial products. So one of the things is, of course, remittances can increase foreign currency reserves. Um, more regulated remittances lead to a better market transparency. Uh, but remittances can also reallocate, or the financial sector in, as a whole, we, we know, can reallocate capital from consumption to production, from rural to uh, from urban to rural, and from uh, less productive uh, areas to uh, uh, more productive areas or education. Um, we know from wider studies that have been done, and there haven't been that many done in my view, but, uh, but we know that there is some tentative evidence that remittances uh, contribute to poverty reduction, to entrepreneurship or more inclusive growth, uh, and to gender equality and women's economic empowerment. So for us as a uh, UN agency, that's a clear reason to interview, uh, intervene in the remittances space as well. Um, so when we started talking to these uh, to the migrants here in Bangkok, and we asked them how they sent their money back and forth, um, what we found actually is that many of the migrants uh, who sent their money from uh, from Thailand, um, they do so through through a couple of stages. Um, they either send their money. Um, they give it in cash, or they withdraw it from the ATM, or they get it from the bank, and they give it often to a, a, an agent, often an informal agent. This is particularly for the Thailand-Myanmar corridor. Uh, what happened is the agent is in contact with another agent at the other side of the border. Um, sometimes they do remittances hub, so they don't even make a transaction with each other, but often they sort of uh, send the money back and forth. Um, and then that agent does a home delivery. Um, so at the doorsteps of the final migrant. Um, or the migrant can pick up the money at a bank branch or at a uh, access point. Um, what we notice is that most of the remittance recipients are women, and uh, most of the senders are both men and women in that, in that process. But so there's a lot of steps in between sending the money back and forth, and 80% of the remittances channeled from Thailand to Myanmar we have found to be done so through informal and unregulated uh, channels. Um, and then there's two options at the recipient end. Either the recipient can, of course, cash out the money. The other option is that the recipient can uh, put the money into a savings or maybe into a productive uh, investment. Um, and what we found, uh, not just through our research, but also through the ILO research that has been done on the Triangle Project uh, um, here at the UN, uh, one third of the um, uh, recipients res used their money productively. Two thirds of the remittance recipients used the money for consumption and daily expenses. And we also found that different user cases were there for different corridors. So for example, in Cambodia, recipients often made savings and paid off debt. In Myanmar, recipients used the money for education. In Vietnam, uh, people supported their family members um, for both paying off debt and education. Uh, in Laos, uh, housing and education was, uh, was 
data to be a, a useful remittance. Uh, those are the more productive examples of, of remittances. Um, we then looked at the, but the key thing here is that there's, so there's a need for three things. One is if we make these, um, if, if we make this process from sender to receiver digital, we may be able to make the steps less complicated and, and faster. The other thing is uh, different re remittance recipients have different needs and different expenditure patterns. And the third one is that um, uh, often there's a cash out happening rather than a reinvestment into other products. And we'll get to that later when we discuss the challenge that we ask the private sector to uh, uh, look into. Um, we then went also with these National Financial Inclusion Service, we looked at how many receivers are we really talking about. So in the Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos and Vietnam alone, we're talking about 3.6 million receivers. And the majority of them receive their money from Thailand and Malaysia. Um, we found that 60% of them were women and 75% of those women and men were living in rural areas. Um, informal channels were widely used in specific corridors. I will show that uh, after this slide. Um, and particularly um, the average monthly remittance uh, amount was estimated around $177 for the low income migrants. Um, what we also found is that many of the remittance recipients already had access to financial services. Um, they saved informally and they accessed credit either formally or informally. Um, so that's another area that we, we felt uh, is interesting to see that people use informal remittances channels and they don't necessarily link them to other products. Um, we then asked uh, somewhat the same question that we asked to the audience when they registered for this uh, webinar. Uh, what do you think that senders and receivers liked about the informal channels and what did they dislike about the formal channels? Um, on the informal channels, people generally said that uh, it was convenient, that there's a home delivery service, that there's a pickup service, um, that they trust them, uh, or at least it's perceived as trustworthy, uh, that it's fast with uh, less paperwork. Um, on the formal channels, and we didn't find too many people using the formal channels uh, in, in the qualitative interviews, but that the time is an issue, that it's not always convenient for uh, migrants, low-income migrants, to access the, uh, the banking systems. Even if the bank's around the corner, um, here in, in Bangkok, for example, after five o'clock, uh, after six o'clock, they close, and the migrants sometimes have, uh, have, have long, uh, from construction workers have long working hours. Uh, so they weren't always there when the bank uh, was open. Um, the other thing is that it, the bank might be far away, um, or there's not enough branches, um, and uh, then there's a lot of documentation requirements, uh, some paperwork. Um, uh, they, they didn't really seem to be nice of the banking system. Um, so many migrants, in fact, prefer to use those informal systems. And in a way, the informal sector has a competitive advantage over the formal remittances, over the traditional banks. Um, and that's something to take into account from a private sector perspective as well. Um, and so therefore, as I mentioned, we launched a challenge fund, which was the initial idea behind doing this research to shape that challenge. We said, what would be the main challenge? And we identified roughly three. So one is to customize products to the remittance recipients, uh, who are often women and in rural areas. The other one is to um, digitize remittances flows better, but in a way that makes it convenient for uh, recipients. Um, and, and so awareness raising may, may include that, for example. And the last one is to link remittances better to other financial services, uh, and ideally to, to make those uh, investments, uh, to, to make the use of remittances more productively. Um, we have launched this window back in April, and we had received 28 expression of interest from 26 applicants. Those included banks, payment platforms, uh, firms, uh, fintech firms, uh, NGOs, uh, MNOs, uh, telcos, and uh, microfinance institutions one in microfinance institution. 
we uh, received uh, in all corridors uh, um, we received applica applications for, through uh, uh, Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos and Vietnam from sending countries in particular Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia uh, and also South Korea, Japan, uh, Hong Kong and United Arab Emirates there was one uh, um, for partners, we have, uh, as part of the, the uh, UNCDF shift program, we have a challenge fund, which has an investment committee, uh, which then screens all these applications, all these expression of interest. Uh, after that expression of interest round, I think we short selected uh, 10 in total, um, of which eight organizations, 10 uh, applications. And um, we then went to another round to finalize the selection. Uh, on our investment committee, uh, we were really lucky to have uh, a lot of uh, knowledgeable uh, experts. Uh, we had a person from uh, Mars. Uh, we have uh, Juanita Woodward in our investment committee who has worked in Singapore for a long time um, as a uh, remittance specialist. Um, we had... Uh, Trying to move. Ah, yeah, we, we have one person from <laughs> we have one person from the uh, International Association for Remittances, the former CEO of MoneyGram, um, and uh, a number of other uh, uh, experts are there. Um, so they ended up uh, supporting, being strong supporters in the selection process of this uh, final candidates, who we're going to uh, announce uh, next week at this fintech festival in Singapore. Um, the four uh, final applicants uh, who are uh, selected for the uh, product innovation uh, uh, matching grants are uh, Value, which is a mobile wallet platform that's based in uh, Malaysia and that will provide low-cost international remittances service from Thailand and Malaysia into the Myanmar corridor. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the uh, highest corridors in, in terms of informal uh, finance. A transfer to who uh, um, Gabor will be much better in explaining the, uh, the, the digital innovation there. It's basically a, a remittances uh, hub um, that supports uh, migrant workers to send transfers directly uh, to loans and savings accounts helped by family members at microfinance institutions uh, and to set up the, the network between senders and receivers. Uh, AMK, which is one of the leading microfinance agencies in uh, Cambodia, and uh, they're also one of the first to start piloting among the microfinance institutions in Cambodia, remittances services, and aiming again to link those services with other products. Um, and finally, uh, Singtel, which has set up a, a remittances app um, that can enable uh, cash out points um, uh, and, and uh, offers uh, partner networks in uh, Myanmar in, in particular. Um, and with that, um, so those are the four final applicants. And what we wanted to do for the remainder of this, this uh, webinar is actually to offer you an example, uh, the example of Transfer2 uh, and uh, their remittances uh, innovation. Uh, Gabor? Yes, uh, thank you. So my name is Gabor Hava. It's an honor speaking to you. I represent here Transfer2 and we are very grateful for United Nations uh, Capital Development Fund to select one of our projects uh, for their shift program. Transfer2 is uh, a global money transfer network. Maybe if we could go to the next slide. So Transfer is a global money transfer network and uh, we help uh, companies, licensed entities such as banks, mobile wallet operators, cash pickup agents and home delivery companies to serve their customers better and to operate in the person-to-person -person, uh, remittances uh, space. Ignacio, could you please just shift the slides? Thank you. Transfer2 is a 12-year-old company, and since our foundation, we have processed more than 300 million transactions. Currently, we have over 1,000 partners in more than 130 countries. 
the company itself is uh, headquartered in Singapore, but we have 10 other offices and about 100 uh, employees. The important thing, the most important aspect of our work is just the connection that we create between people working abroad and those beneficiaries re, uh, living in the, country, in the countries where the workers have left from. Generally speaking, when we look at the study that United Nations Capital Development Fund prepared, we, we noticed two important things. In, in, the, in the next slide, it's, it's very important to notice, and actually I took those two charts from the United Nations uh, study, that uh, there are 8 million migrants from Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam. With 168 million population, this puts us to the problem space where we have to notice that 1.6 million people claim not to have proper access to remittances. And since 16% of the respondents claimed also that the remittance cost is too high, it adds an additional 1.3 million people who just can't afford to have proper access to remittances. So when we looked at this study and when we received the, the grant application documentation from UNCDF, we, we immediately saw that there is like a 3 million people big opportunity that we have to fix. These people currently don't have proper, accessible, affordable, available remittances and the transfer to in our opinion is very well positioned to help it. The reason why we are well positioned uh, to help Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar and Vietnam is on the next slide. We strongly believe that mobile wallets will play an essential role in, in the financial decisions. A few years ago in, in 2016, we did uh, a study. In this study, we have actually noticed that there are 277 mobile wallets, mobile money services in 92 countries. This number is growing. By 2020, our forecast shows that uh, the current 500 million users might increase to more than 1 billion. All these numbers were prior to Indian demonetization. Now, now the numbers I think we should even revise and the real number is like 1.2, 1.5 billion by 2020. On the other hand, this set of mobile money services is a very one-sided allocation. There are only 35 mobile money services in the world, according to our study, which have more than 1 million active accounts. This is one, this is one out of eight mobile wallets. 12% of mobile wallets have a big traction enough. So when we look at remittances, uh, we see that mobile wallets will play a more and more important role, but on the other hand, they still represent a relatively small share in the financial world. So in, in some countries and in some areas, these mobile wallet services have uh, already surpassed the traditional financial system. In Sub-Saharan Africa, there are almost three times as many mobile money accounts than actual bank cards, but there is still a long way to go. That's why when we talk about remittances, we will always have to consider that any traditional banking, traditional financial system, mobile wallets and alternative channels, such as cash pickup, home delivery services have to work together. There are countries where uh, the penetration of traditional banking services is high. According to the State Bank of Vietnam statistics, in Vietnam there are 102 million, 120 million cards issued. That's more than the po entire population of the country. On the other hand, some estimates put the banked population in Myanmar to 8 to 10 percent. So in the end, we will have to consider, if we are talking about the Mekong region, different approaches. One remittance approach that is focusing only on bank accounts might work in Vietnam, but might not work in Myanmar. If we are talking about mobile wallets and we want to create only a mobile wallet-based channel, 
then maybe it might work in Vietnam, where Wing Cambodia already did a great work, but uh, might not work in Laos. So the project that we have submitted and which won the support of United Nations Capital Development Fund is a project that is trying to provide the biggest network and the highest availability to its users. In the project slide, the next slide, what we have applied for and what we are trying to achieve with the United Nations funding is to create the largest, most available, most accessible and most affordable remittance network. Transfer to is a hub. We set the target that we will work with 12 receiving partners in Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar and Vietnam. These partners will come from the traditional banking background. There will be digital wallets, mobile financial services, and there will be microfinance institutions. The mix of these remittance corridors is so important to us because uh, country by country, the financial behavior is different and because we want to bring remittances down to the ground, to the people, even in the most remote villages. 70% of remittance recipients in these countries live in the countryside. A bank-based solution cannot succeed in our opinion in these countries. If we want to make sure that everybody has access to the remittances, we can't focus on the banking services. We have to bring in microfinance institutions who have the agent network and who have the staff to visit every little village in the countryside and deliver the remittances that, that was hard earned by a son working in a distant country. We also have to make sure that wherever digital pets, mobile money services are available, we rely on those services. They have additional convenience, safety, availability features that is super important to us. So the project is uh, going to be the most accessible, most available by its core. We will try to make sure that by mixing these three different type of remittance receiving partners, we will be able to deliver the empowerment that these women need. According to the World Economic Forum, the Global Gender Gap Report that they published just a week ago, the women and the female economic participation in these countries is quite good. These countries generally in the global ranking, according to World Economic Forum, rank between 60 to 80 globally in terms of gender gap. But in economic participation, these countries rank 20, 30 in the world, beating not once advanced European economies. So women are in the center of economy. They also receive remittances. So if we want to make sure these women will be able to use the remittance services, we will have to connect these remittances to additional services. With the microfinance institutions, we will try to leverage on additional savings product, educational product, or maybe even foreign worker loans, just to make sure that women will have a bigger say in, their, uh, in the finances of their household. Furthermore, none of this network will be ever of any use if we don't make sure that people know about it. Many digital wallet services currently focus only on mobile phone top-ups, prepaid cards. This is not a use case that would trigger in anybody's mind that this service, this mobile wallet could be used for receiving remittances. That's why we will also invest quite a big chunk of the grant and or resources and or effort into making sure that people will be aware of the service and that they understand the benefits of using remittances in a responsible, investable way and will not spend entirely only on living expenses. So generally speaking, when we look into the future and we will try to figure out that what is after we have implemented this project and what shortcomings and troubles we might see down the road when we will work on achieving the goals of this project, we have to notice that uh, there are certain troubles with 
mobile wallets as remittance receiving devices. If you look at the next slide, it's, it's quite obvious that smartphone penetration and mobile phone penetration is on the right track. A few years ago, SIM cards were fam famously and well known expensive in Myanmar. One SIM card could cost a few thousand dollars. Now, even the phones are down to a few hundred dollars price. There are many digital wallet users in Vietnam. Laos also has an excellent mobile penetration rate. We are committed to use mobile wallets and digital, digitalized remittance channels as much as possible. On the other hand, with United Nations and also with the local regulators and the local mobile wallet services, we believe that there are three key points we will need to work on. One of those points is clearly the use case we, uh, we will have to teach to the consumers. Topping up a mobile phone using a digital wallet service is the easy use case. Many mobile wallets in the region do it because they have to show traction, they have to show transaction numbers to their investors. We will need to teach the mobile wallet users that with this service they can also receive remittances. This is a very different use case. Trusting a system with $5 top of value or trusting a system with $200, $300, $400 of your monthly income is an entirely different level of trust. It will require a lot of education and a lot of awareness building. Also, many of these mobile wallets currently see a very slow adoption rate because they go for the carrot. And from the carrot and the stick approach, the stick is missing. We would like to convince some mobile wallets to have hard incentive for traction. Maybe it's not, not like at the level of Indonesia's, India's demonetization plan, but the mobile wallets will have to recognize that as soon as merchants start to demand from their customers the payment by a mobile wallet, then the adoption of mobile wallets for payment service and money management service will be soaring. And then, as a third point, we also would like to, uh, to address after the project or during the project with the help of United Nations, the interoperability. Apple globally can allow itself not to be compatible with any other mobile phone services. In Cambodia, in Laos, in Myanmar and in Vietnam, none of the mobile wallet services have this amount of power over the consumers. They are competing with cash. Cash is absolutely interoperable. If mobile wallet services would like to take over the cash space and they would like to become the digitized form of cash, then they will have to work towards interoperability. With our project, we can't address these three points but we can lobby to have these three points developed in Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam. And we see them as important aspects besides transfer to the United Nations working together to bring remittances. We can bring the remittances, but consumer behavior has to change. And in that, we can play one part, but mobile wallets, regulators, and merchants will also have to play they, their part. This was my presentation. Thank you very much, Ignacio, for the opportunity. And I think we should just progress towards uh, Q&A. Yes, thank you. Um, OK. Um, you would take the Q&A, Ignacio. All right, I will do. Um, so thank you very much, Gabor and Malin. Uh, super interesting. I hope uh, everyone thought that was um, Interesting as well. I thought that maybe we could start with the questions that were sent over to the chat, seeing as they've been 
uh, very patient. Uh, first of all, we've got a question uh, from Virak uh, from right at the beginning of the presentation, uh, where he's asking, how do you identify informal flows? So I suppose this question is for you, Robin. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so it's a good question. Basically, uh, there's, there's two ways of uh, measuring it. One is uh, any remittance transaction that didn't get a, a receipt or a, a sort of a transaction data point. Uh, uh, so below the below the radar transaction, in other words, the uh, other one, uh, and that's the one that's used in the FinScope uh, in, in the surveys that we, we we use, is what type of provider is sending back and forth the remittances. So if that is an agent uh, who is not registered, then that's sort of considered informal. Uh, if that is a registered uh, uh, entity, uh, for example, if it would be a, a Cambodian uh, microfinance agency, then it uh, it would be uh, uh, formal. Okay. Okay. Um, another question sent in by Nilar. Uh, this informal that uh, amount is uh, very uh, close to similar with formal flow, like six to seventeen million. And so, any specific finding on the one, it is uh, still a large amount of informal yeah. flow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me actually. Uh, share my screen here on that um, with a slightly different we haven't shown that yet so I might as well show it now um, yeah um, what we developed as part of the, um, the this national financial inclusion survey is actually a dashboard which can carve out some of these questions uh, that you might have um, and uh, one of the things is, so, so here you see the, the overall national financial inclusion for Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar. Um, and what the, because the, the question, the, the answer to your question might be different per country or per corridor. But actually what this dashboard can do is it can uh, analyze differences across countries. And if we see something similar happening in all three countries, then we know that that's a, a prominent re reason of why, for example, uh, people prefer informal uh, remittances over formal. Now, one of the things that we found is that it's very corridor specific. So one of the things people were asked where they got their money from, from which country. And if we, if we say uh, Thailand, what we see here is in Thailand, Myanmar corridor, 80% of the uh, remittances were informal. In the Laos, uh, Thailand corridor, that's 50% and 47%. Um, in Cambodia, there's much more formalized uh, remittances, particularly because in the domestic remittances space, uh, people are using mobile money more often. So you've got about 2 million people on a 10 million uh, adult population in uh, Cambodia using mobile money. Uh, so that, that's one, one example. Now, if we, if we compare then, uh, for example, Malaysia, um, what we see is that in the Myanmar, uh, the Malaysia Myanmar corridor, it's about 60% uh, of the remittances being formal, whereas in the uh, Thailand Myanmar corridor, that's only 20%. Um, and um, as part of uh, what I mentioned, there's been an ILO research which uh, is uh, uh, under publication. It's not yet published, but it's more or less uh, being disseminated. And a lot of these things, for example, have to do with a lot of the reasons behind formality are also uh, correlated or, or linked to the working conditions and uh, whether there's a formal or an informal employment contract uh, of, of migrants, uh, whether it's seasonal, uh, whether they came into the country uh, legally, illegally. So those are some of the underlying factors as well, um, as well as uh, the access to digital uh, services. So even if we would digitize if, even if everybody would have access to a mobile wallet, uh, there's still other other reasons, of course, other things that we need to do if we want to formalize the full flow. Um, but if you see that in some countries it's 50/50, that's how that that explains why. Uh, to come back to the answer to your uh, question, uh, why some of the why this 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 uh, potential market uh, gap is so large. Okay. Um. All right, uh, the next two questions are, I think, for Gabor. Uh, so 
do does transfer to foresee that the mobile wallet usage will overtake the traditional banking channel uh, in developed countries such as Singapore, United Kingdom, etc. This is from AMTH. I'm, I'm afraid I don't know your name, <laughs> but AMTH. Okay, so dear AMTH, this is a very complex and tricky question. I just came back from Australia where I have attended the FinTech Summit and uh, the platform, chief platform officer of Sterling Bank cited a very interesting statistic. She said that in the United Kingdom, 8% of the marriages is uh, ending with divorce. Only, on the other hand, only 2% of the people said that they would consider changing their bank. So if you're living in the United Kingdom, you love the queen and you have a bank account there, it's four times more likely that you will uh, get divorced than you change your bank. In this setting, it's very unlikely that a mobile wallet service would uh, quickly overtake traditional banking channel. Also, banks are, are investing heavily into their own mobile wallet services. So in developed markets, if we talk about Singapore or United Kingdom, I think the banks will have a controlled lose of market share, but they won't be overtaken. Developing markets, on the other hand, are an entirely different story. And, and I wouldn't compare the United Kingdom landscape to, to the Myanmar landscape. Great, thanks. Uh... Thanks for that very interesting answer. And um, also the example that you used. <laughs> uh, another question from Virak. Um, based on your experience, this is for Gabor again. Uh, based on your experience, transaction costs, uh, are the transaction costs the huge challenges for your projects? Obviously and definitely. Nobody, nobody likes to pay uh, for transferring uh, money across borders. So I, I haven't met any customer who, who would have ever said that, oh, transaction cost is just high, I'm okay to pay this or that percentage. Mm, okay. When it comes to remittances, it always has to be as low as possible. They, these uh, workers work hard to earn their money, and families, on the other hand, really need this money. So what transfer is trying to do and what is the core of our value proposition is negotiating for bulk discount. Whenever transfer to goes to, to a bank in, or a mobile wallet service in Vietnam, Cambodia, Myanmar, or, or any of the countries where we operate, we tell the receiving partner that we can bring you volume. Right now, this partner might try building its remittance connections and try to find sending partners, banks, money transfer organizations in Malaysia, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in United Kingdom, in US or in Australia. For that, they need to employ business development persons. They need to pay the salaries, they need to pay flights, internet expenses, phone expenses, accommodation. Building a remittance network is expensive. And then they have to integrate with every sender entity one by one. Transfer to, on the other hand, as soon as it goes to a remittance receiving partner, can say that I have a network of 130 countries. My forecast is that I, you will have 1 million, 2 million receiver, uh, senders and an X amount of dollars coming to you in a month or in a year. And please, based on this volume, give me a discount. This way, the partner doesn't have to employ an entire business development army and an entire IT army to manage the integrations. They can get everything from one single partner. I will also manage the settlement, the transactions, and the reporting for them. And from that discount that they gave to me, I will keep a small percentage for my margin and to the senders, I can also sell it at a lower price. Because this way, senders also don't have to integrate one by one, travel to Myanmar to find the right partner, go through the compliance procedure, go to the KYC procedure, 
then uh, do the IT integration. So the aggregator models in which also transfer to is operating is reducing in our opinion and in our estimation the transfer cost because we negotiate bulk prices. Okay, is there something that you want to add to that, Robin? Yeah, actually, what we can uh, we can show um, this is a uh, slide on where, where we where we looked at the different providers, traditional providers like in in Thailand, uh, in those different corridors: Thailand to Cambodia, Thailand to Laos, Thailand to Myanmar, Thailand to Vietnam. Um, and if you if you see in the top right, those are the transaction speed and transaction cost of uh, small value remittances. Of course, for, for doing a five thousand dollar transaction, might not be that much more expensive. But but on the two hundred dollars, it becomes a, a challenge. To uh, transaction costs are becoming increasingly challenging. Um, and and so we see that most of these traditional providers are uh, above ten percent transaction cost. And it often also takes more than 50 hours to uh, to send the money uh, back and forth. Uh, whereas those new digital providers, uh, MoneyGram, SpeedSend, uh, also Western Union here, Express Money, uh, they have much faster ways of transacting the uh, the funds below uh, roughly let's say 20, 24 hours, um, but also at a, at a much lower uh, percentage cost. Uh, so two things are quite interesting in this graph. One is that the digital providers seem to have a much lower transaction cost for those low value remittances. But the other thing is that you see that there's such a high variety in transaction costs still um, on our 2017, uh, that part hasn't been solved. Um, even though we, we, we think often that you know, we're dealing with competitive market processes where there's, there's one single price, it can actually vary quite a bit in the area of remittances. So, I mean, if transaction costs are so important, I think that sort of leads to another question I've received here from AMTH as well, uh, which is how are organizations going to tackle the use of informal flow? Yeah, that's that's the challenge that that's we're hoping to. That's a big challenge, to, isn't it? <laughs> that's a big question. <laughs> to see if, 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 particularly, let's say, taking taking Myanmar as a, as a market to see whether in the next uh, two years or three years uh, we, we can all come back at you at the, uh, hopefully, at the FinTech Festival of 2021. Uh, and, and, and say that we, we've, we've managed to tackle that challenge. But I think a big issue uh, there is, is to work along the lines of those convenience factors and to also recognize these informal flows as a main competition. Um, it's quite easy to say that the, the traditional banks who are themselves not remittances specialists maybe, uh, are your main competitors, but it's also it's quite in order to sort of recognize that maybe sometimes we're competing with those small informal agents uh, in the informal sector. Hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, okay. We just got another question here uh, from from Greta. In Myanmar, there's a gender gap in mobile phone ownership of 29%, and women have lower digital knowledge. Which are the solutions and vision to solve these issues while promoting technological innovations for remittances uh, with the ultimate goal of promoting gender equality? Can I ask you to answer that one? Me? <laughs> <laughs> On the financial. So, so uh, I mean, the solution is, 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 a, is a, a tough word because it's a real challenge. Um, there, there have, of course, been uh, financial literacy being a, an, an option there. Um, which, which you can either offer directly to training, but on the previous challenge fund window, uh, UNCDF has launched a, a digital financial app, which, uh, which is sort of playing is a gamification app. It's giving games um, with the idea to uh, um, increase financial awareness and uh, financial literacy for women. Uh, nonetheless, um, this is a this is a tough thing for for, uh, for a remote woman. Uh, living below the poverty line uh, in in in, uh, in difficult place in Myanmar, so that's that's not uh, it's easier said than done. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, okay, well those are, those are the questions that have come through the chat. Uh, you know, it's it's been an hour, but I think maybe there could be some other questions um, that some of the participants may have. Uh, The mic is open. 
People need to unmute themselves. Yeah, yeah. You have to unmute yourself before you uh, <laughs> on the right side before of the you ask the question. And otherwise, in the meantime, um, as we're showing here on the on the um, on the screen itself, um, it might be good to highlight where you can find here our remittances study. Uh, we have a, uh, a study which is about 30 pages done on the um, on, on on the remittances paper. It's got all the data in it. Uh, we also have a short infographic of a two pages. Uh, as well as wrote a blog on this, um, and we just published a blog this week on the four challenge fund partners. If you want, if you're interested to learn more about all four of them, next week, uh, if you happen to be in Singapore, uh, please do uh, uh, come and visit. Uh, we invite you all to come from 10:30 to 11:20 um, in the cloud. Now, I don't know if the cloud is a room. It's the venue event, okay, uh, at the finger at the Singapore FinTech Festival, uh, which is uh, hosted by uh, by Mass. That that uh, we have launched this challenge on window in partnership with. Okay, well, um, no, no more questions to the chat, and um, as far as we can hear, no more questions from uh, from the other participants. So we've reached the hour. Uh, I don't know if. Robin or Gabor have any closing remarks or anything? Well, thank you for uh, for attending this webinar, of course. And if you have any further uh, questions to us or are interested, uh, uh, please uh, uh, stay in touch um, and, uh, and and feel free to send us any emails. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely, Gabor. Thank you for the webinar. Thank you for all the attendees to attend. Okay. Okay. Well. Exactly. Thank you, uh, everyone, for being here. Uh, this is a very interesting experience. I think also uh, the topic has been very interesting. We've been working on it for about a year now. Uh, so, you know, if you're interested in it, please do get in contact with us, either me or Robin. Rob, uh, like you said, will be in Singapore next week. Uh, but otherwise, uh, through email, our office is here in Bangkok, uh, and we're always available for, uh, for questions or for conversations or meetings. So please do reach out. So thank you, everyone. Uh, until the next time.